Good morning, Revolution. Hello, everybody out there on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter world. Hope everybody's doing great. Uh, we have a very interesting conversation this morning. We're going to be talking about where uh, does working class power uh, exist in this country and is it getting more powerful or is it lessening? That's the first thing we're going to Secondly, be talking about a rise in uh, right wing, really kind of fascist like activity in merry old New England. Uh, and then uh, we're going to conclude by talking about the uh, situation and the upcoming midterms, the January 6th hearing. Uh, and then uh, we'll be dealing with our mailbag. We have a very interesting question from one of our, our readers. So, um, we want to welcome Sandy Eaton, who's uh, joining us from Massachusetts. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy, Retired healthcare worker, and he'll be helping us hone in on a very ugly and brutal uh, racist and fascist attack that took place in uh, the Boston area uh, a week or two ago. But first, uh, job market is still tight. Unemployment is ticking up. The much vaunted power of the working class that existed during the pandemic, according to the Wall Street Journal, is waning. But Anita, how do you define that? I never, when I, I, I had a good friend of mine who wrote me a note, and, uh, I guess about a year ago, and uh, after a story had been published in the New York Times. Uh, that uh, argued that uh, because unemployment was so high and and the uh, uh, job market, uh, they were having so much problems finding uh, people to work that there was that there was a labor shortage. They were mm -hmm. saying that uh, uh, working class uh, had a much better bargaining position. Uh, a great. What do they call it? The great, uh, not resignation. recession, but great resignation, resignation was taking place. Um, but that always puzzled me because the uh, situation in the trade union movement, uh, the number of workers who are organized is at an all time low. Uh, a lot of strikes took place. Uh, some of them were victorious, some, some not. Is there a difference between the way the Wall Street Journal defines working class power on the one hand and CPUSA.org on the other? Uh, well, you're, you won't be surprised uh, that I would say, yeah, there's a difference. I mean, we really look at things completely differently in the Wall Street Journal. And that article that we read from the Wall Street Journal really seemed to be focused on a certain segment of workers, and that is workers that are negotiating uh, conditions for their jobs. So it's workers who are are. Um, I mean, for us in the in the Communist Party, I, everybody who sells their labor power in the capitalist system in order to sustain themselves and to reproduce themselves, those those people are worker working class. Um, and it it it's a, an analytical distinction. Sometimes it's not so easy to take one person and decide, is this a working class or a, you know, something else kind of person that it's not an individual level uh, concept. It's really the, the power of the working class as a whole that we're looking at, or the, the independence of the working class as a whole. Um, so the, the Wall Street Journal was really concerned with a very small segment of workers, working people, still workers who are, you know, selling their labor power to uh, big corporations and might want to negotiate, you know, time out of the office or, you know, better benefits or something like that. Um, but really not talking about the broad uh, uh, changes that are going on in our economy today. And I think Scott, workers still have a lot of power, you know, today. Scott, still, not to discount anything Anita just said, but isn't it the case that the great resignation took place kind of across the board. Uh, a lot of people stayed home. Uh, they had those uh, pandemic checks. A lot of people left their jobs because they felt that they weren't safe, particularly in, in sections of the service industry and in healthcare. 
so, so um, my question uh, again is, um, how do we uh, define when workers have power and when they don't? Well, there are a lot of different ways of having power. Um, and I think we have to recognize that the kind of workers power that the Wall Street Journal talks about is um, kind of a fake one. The idea that there are market conditions under which the working class has power and other market conditions under which it doesn't is, um, I think, incredibly, uh, well, it, it makes sense if you're a capitalist, right? If you don't ever look outside of the market. Um, the reason, the, the workers power that we saw uh, during the great resignation was not based on, you know, a labor shortage on, on a tight labor market. It was based on the fact that working class people had organized politically, had elected uh, an administration um, and a Congress uh, that, you know, saw the need, uh, at least at the beginning, to, um, you know, to provide unemployment benefits to stop the, you know, looming crisis uh, of, of unemployment and eviction, um, lack of housing to stop that from worsening. Uh, and so, yeah, people had a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a cushion against the worst attacks of the capitalist class, which was trying to force everyone, uh, back into work in, in the most, you know, exploitative possible conditions, uh, as, as we saw in a lot of Republican controlled states that actually refused, um, federal, uh, unemployment money. Um, because they wanted to keep, you know, people under the thumb of employers. So we, it was workers' power, but it was not based on the market. It was based on the ability to win um, programs that provided some relief. And I think that's an important distinction. Seems to me that uh, power um, for the capitalists means when they have the greatest flexibility to demand from labor and to get from labor what they want. And the reverse is also true. To me, real working class power will obtain when we see three, four, five percent increase in the ranks of the AFL CIO um, and other unions. Uh, and until that happens, uh, I'm not going to be believing what's printed in the Wall Street Journal. Let's move the agenda. Uh, Sandy, uh, I think on July 2nd or 3rd, there was a uh, racist and fascist march through Boston. A young artist, a black artist, was beaten to death. How is Boston responding? Well, the official word, both from um, our uh, US attorney uh, 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 let's see, what's her name? Uh, Rachel Rollins, who used to be the DA for the for Suffolk County in which Boston resides, and the police department is that they caught caught by surprise. Um, yes, it, it uh, uh, the response has been largely the uh, clergy led and uh, civil rights coalitions uh, coming out and making demands on the city of Boston and on the police authorities um, to be more vigilant. Um, uh, the, the the official police response was that uh, uh, they didn't see them coming, but once they were here, they were able to follow their progress across the th city through their surveillance uh, cameras, you know, the um, uh, traffic cameras that are set up at all the intersections. And we sometimes see on uh, um, TV shows, uh, um, uh, you know, apparently, which also frightens me, the fact that police surveillance can be that thorough. And they felt confident that they could follow the, uh, of the march of about a hundred Patriot Front folks in full regalia, with masks, with shields, uh, with flagpoles, um, you know, looking very, uh, uh, yeah, you know, militant, uh, marching uh, from um, from the coming out of the subway, um, which they had taken in from the suburbs where they parked their cars, and and marching uh, through the tourist area, uh, through the, the so-called Freedom Trail, uh, um, in, on the uh, Saturday of the uh, July 4th weekend uh, was pretty frightening. Um, see, the last time before the pandemic, uh, there was a major um, event in Boston when uh, right-wing groups from around, uh, uh, from far away, as well as locally, 
came together on the Boston Common and, and held a rally, which they call the Free Speech Rally, so that they could say their stuff uh, and get, get um, you know uh, claim legitimacy for doing that. The, the community responded. Uh, we had thousands of folks who marched uh, from Roxbury uh, through, through the uh, Back Bay and South End and up to the common and, and, and formed a cordon, a huge cordon right around uh, uh, that particular rally uh, by the right wing. Uh, the police stood between and there was a minimal of confrontation as such at that time. But that was before the pandemic. And it was after um, the hor horrific events in, uh, in uh, Charlottesville, is it, uh, Virginia? Um, uh, where someone was run down or where an anti-fascist was run down and, and so forth. So th there's a response. Um, it, I, I think uh, the, the forces that would have come out if they knew they were coming uh, uh, didn't know it. The other question is who did and with all of the police surveillance going on, why didn't they know? And, and, and then once it became known, why didn't they do something uh, more forcefully? seems to me like that's a rather safe and distant uh, approach to following a march if they're just following it on the uh, surveillance uh, uh, camera. Oh, 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 are, are, well, are well policed, believe me. <laughs> but how is the city responding? I mean, is, is there a huge public outcry? I think I overspoke, uh, I, I overstated oh, the point. The council last yeah. week. That that's wasn't right. to death. Condemning and, uh, injuries and uh, the let's see, Mayor Michelle Wu. Boston has a new mayor, uh, uh, a person of color, and a woman. So it's a tremendous breakthrough, quite frankly, in local politics. And the and the composition of the Boston City Council is has uh, uh, grown and matured very much uh, since the last time I I live outside of Boston. I, although I'm a Bostonian, I grew up there. Um, um, it's a lot of a lot of new folks there, and most of them are very welcome. Um, her response uh, addressing the white supremacists was, "When we march, we don't hide our faces. Your hate is as cowardly as it is disgusting, and it goes against all that Boston stands for." So the mayor is uh, is clearly uh, seeing what the issues are. The city council passed a resolution unanimously um, uh, last month on. Um, uh, uh, so, I mean, the, 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 there's that kind of stuff at officialdom. And the forces are still there in the community. The coalitions are still there. But in terms of this specific event, uh, it, they were sort of caught by surprise. And, and at the same time, over that same weekend, and the 4th of July weekend was deliberately picked, of course, to come to Boston um, um, because of its uh, context, its significance. Um, in uh, the... Um, uh, upscale uh, North Shore community of Ipswich, uh, Ziploc bags filled with stones uh, with a, a printed message of white, white supremacy was dropped apparently selectively on the lawns that also had Black Lives Matter signs posted. Uh, in the very, very ritzy town of Chatham down on Cape Cod, uh, um, uh, a similar message from signed by a, a, apparently a different group was left all over the place and in the university town of Amherst in Western Massachusetts, um, hmm. a, a very liberal place also. That seemed, for, for whatever reason, these white liberal communities seem to be the target this time around. It's not always been that way. Uh, last year or the year before, I remember there were these similar uh, posts put up, posters put up and literature distribute in the very working class uh, and, and, and very integrated uh, community of uh, Dorchester, a part of Boston. So. Um, it seemed almost like there was a conscious decision to aim for this particular community this time and come back and, and uh, you know, do it other, other times, other places. I'm wondering what the community response has been, because it seems to me that what's taking place in Massachusetts is also taking place in Rhode Island. It's also taking place in Maine. It's taking place in Connecticut, where these groups are distributing hate literature. Um, in uh, different neighborhoods, whether they be suburban or, or urban. And um, it seems to me that uh, in light of what's taking place, uh, what we saw in the hearings uh, about January 6th in uh, Washington, 
uh, that we can't, Scott, take these kinds of activities lightly. Um, Absolutely and not. There it, needs, oh, sorry, go finish, on. Joe. No, I just want to say that there, there needs to be a response from the churches and synagogues and mosques, the, the trade unions, uh, the community groups, the movements of the African American, Latin women, LGBTQ, um, there, in order to confront it. And there needs to be a response from, um, you know, from the working class as a whole. Uh, even if, you know, a section of the class has fallen under the influence of uh, fascist ideology, uh, has embraced uh, white supremacy, um, a, a, a large section, I would, I would even suggest the majority, um, uh, rejects uh, that kind of thing and, and needs to take a stronger role. It needs to be a response from the, the, the federal government as well. This isn't just, you know, up to up to the people and up to the communities um you know we the if you think about reconstruction right um it was uh, a massive exercise of of state power on you know behalf and on the demand of the people and and with the the pushing of you know of the left um and the the uprising of of the the formerly enslaved um but state power was used to dismantle some of the um, apparatus of, of white supremacy and, and reaction. And that's the kind of thing that we need to see. It's not, it's not just, you know, the people, there has to be a real attempt to, to disband these groups. And it is, it is dangerous um, because as we saw all throughout the Trump regime, um, it's a little thing here, a little thing there, an attempt here that's pushed back you know, uh, um, you know, uh, send it, dispatching militias to the border and, and seeing if you could get away with it. Um, because, you know, it's a, it's a show of force. It's an attempt until it actually works. And then it's a, and then it's a fascist coup. This is, we're in an extremely dangerous position. I, I should jump in. In order, in. To, in in order to take strong positions, they took past good resolutions, but we have to get the unions beyond resolutionary politics and have the rank and file mobilized uh, in, into action on, on, on all fronts. And uh, and that's the, the key thing that we're doing within the unions is to try to, you know, my own uh, Massachusetts Nurses Association is taking very good positions, but getting the rank and file uh, out uh, to march. The pastors in, in, who lead the community uh, coalition did hold a rally uh, in front of the Boston Public Library in Copley Square, which was the first launching pad once the uh, fascists came out of the subways, they uh, they rallied there. So uh, the next day, the community rallied in that very same uh, uh, historic location, and 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 that's when they challenged uh, the powers that be to actually be on top of this and not let it slide. Anita, we talk about building a united front against fascism. Who do you go to in the city of Columbus? And then I'm gonna come back to you, Sandy. Who do you go to in the city of Columbus uh, if such an occasion uh, were to develop? Uh, sure. Ohio State, you know, where would you begin to organize? Actually, we do have some uh, some Patriot, Patriot Front or some right-wing uh, groups uh, targeting Ohio State students um, and also Capital University students. Um, the groups that we uh, have been going to, we have we have some very strong uh, uh, organizations in Ohio that um, that fight uh, against um, uh, right wing uh, violence, and um, I, I I I think we we also, as um, Sandy was saying, we we do enlist the the help of. Uh, a trade union movement, the SEIU in, in Columbus is very strong and does come out on the street when um, when necessary. Um, we're I uh, I know in recent uh, days and they they're saying especially in the last month or so the Patriot Front or other and other organizations have been especially targeting LGBTQ events because of Pride Month and also reproductive justice on. Um, events. So we're also reaching out as a club and as a district in Ohio to um, uh, reproductive uh, rights organizations 
that are fighting to protect uh, reproductive justice issues. And also, um, you know, we're, we're, we're working on, uh, well, we also have alliances with the LGBTQ um, community and the trans community in particular. So those are the kind of groups we want to, we want to be in support of to defeat uh, this fascist turn. And Ohio has had this, I mean, we've had this problem longer than New England. I'm, I'm sorry to see that it's, it's, you know, hitting New England in a renewed way. But we have plenty of those groups uh, in Ohio, and I, I fear uh, because of what happened in Akron, and it seems what's happening in Boston, that there's a real affiliation, uh, affinity between police, law enforcement agencies, and these right-wing uh, groups, and that's really frightening to me. Yes. So, Sandy, in Columbus, they go to the trade unions, they go to the reproductive rights groups, they go to the LGBTQ groups. We have a very uh, specific concept of United Front. Um, how, how would you apply it in, in Boston? Uh, those religious figures held that rally at the subway stop. Where else do you go to begin building a people's There is a problem. I, I, I tell folks that we had three major working class historic events in the in last, last month. There was the AFL-CIO convention, there was the Labor Notes Conference, which had uh, capped at 4,000. And of course, there was the uh, uh, the uh, Poor People's Campaign, uh, the Assembly in D.C. People don't see this. People don't look at one, don't look at the uh, events in D.C. and say, that's the working class. How do we get these very various components? And, and, and quite frankly, I am shocked that over the Juneteenth uh, weekend, there was conflict. There was, there was a 4,000 people meeting in Chicago who also should have been in D.C. and folks in D.C. who probably should have been in, in Chicago, um, that divide of organization. And most of our working class isn't uh, in, in a union. And, and, and as we know, that's, uh, that's a prime goal of ours is to uh, get folks organized in the community and in the uh, workplace and get them working together. We talk about the United Front and getting beyond uh, having a, a, a union, uh, my own union, for example, Massachusetts Nurses Association and 1199 SEIU Massachusetts uh, and, and others passing good resolutions. How does it get down to the rank and file? How do we get them, um, you know, uh, to come out and march arm in arm with their sisters and brothers in the community? Um, I don't have a quick answer except day to day, day to day uh, uh, efforts to struggle. Um, and another but, issue that we have to do with the building trades and, and the black community, uh, well, the building trades, rejecting the black community in terms of hiring, that this is in Boston, this has gone back decades and decades. There's been a lot of effort to end that. But we recently had the uh, last past head of the Boston Building Trades Council uh, as its mayor, uh, uh, who is now the Secretary of Labor, who in his administration in Boston never did much to promote the employment of African-American workers and other workers of color. I'm glad we have a new administration in our city and I'm hoping uh, uh, that we can prevail upon it. Right now, there's a group of us that have been working against the level four bioterra lab. Our, our petition that Mayor Wu to sit down with her and and and, and raise questions of public health uh, in, in, in light of uh, uh, ongoing pandemic. So um, yeah. Putting these building blocks in place, really important as we do our work in the local communities. And then Scott, there's the issue of tying it to the midterms because uh, in just a few weeks, uh, election season will be uh, open uh, officially, though it's kind of starting off already. And one of the things that we have to work through is how to continue those relationships into the election campaign, no? Well, absolutely. Uh, but I will say that, you know, the uh, a lot of the Democratic Party, beginning with the current um, presidential administration, is making it real difficult uh, to see the connections between these community issues, these day-to-day uh, -day things, and, um, you know, political mobilization. Because it's pretty clear, I think, to a lot of people that the um, the Republican Party uh, is a huge threat, that it's behind 
uh, that it's the motivating force of a lot of what's going on, or that the, the section of the ruling class that uses it is. Um, what's less clear uh, is that the Democratic Party um, is capable of of confronting that and of summoning any of the unity or the willpower or uh, whatever um, that the that the situation demands. Um, and so, as usual, we're seeing on social media all the posts about um, that try to counterpose uh, elections on the one hand to uh, community mobilization or or whatever on the other. Um, when in fact those two things go together, right? The electoral work should grow out of the uh, coalitions that were built in response to these community events and the um, and that electoral work should also further the organization. Um, but it's it's a hard sell this time because uh, the Democratic Party has been doing not a whole lot in the news that that Joe Manchin uh, has once again decided to um, you know, make himself the, the scapegoat for the entire uh, liberal bourgeoisie and, and reject um, taxing the rich and reject uh, any kind of climate measures in a new spending bill. Uh, it's, it's just making it harder. So, Anita, in, um, when, 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 when we, we respond to uh, some of these developments, particularly in light of the growth of the party, um, mm -hmm. We're seeing that uh, in some occasions, uh, some of our uh, members and clubs think that when you build a united front, you go to other left groups, that's where you start, and then you enlarge the coalition from there. Is that the right approach? Um, Joe, I don't think that really works. We, we have found that does not work uh, in Columbus, and I... Um, I've recommended that it, it, you know, that different strategies be taken in different cities uh, in Ohio too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there are some very sectarian organizations that sometimes they don't even believe uh, in voting or they, they tell their members not even to vote. Um, they are um, not helping, helping the situation. They are not uh, going to be good partners in the United Front. Um, so we have to stay away from the sectarian organizations and go where we're workers actually are, and that is those community organizations, like Sandy was saying, the faith organizations, um, the, uh, the, the uh, LGBTQ and free pro uh, justice organizations, um, those are the organizations that we're really going to reach out to. And we're, uh, you know, labor new, um, the resurgence of the labor movement and our, you know, our two Starbucks in, um, in Columbus um, winning their union. There's just a lot of energy among young people, young workers, and um, they recognize that the GOP plans are tragic and destructive and, and just completely bad for everyone. Um, and they are there. They may not be in love with uh, Joe Biden right now, but they recognize the danger of the GOP agenda and are willing to fight against it, like voting against J.D. Vance, for example. In, so uh, primary the, frame, the purpose of the United Front concept is to unite the class. That's right. Is to right. unite the class, and therefore we have to be involved in the places, as Anita said, where the class is found, and the class is found on the campuses, in the workplaces, in the churches, in the synagogues, in the community organizations. That's where we have to move people in the barbershops, in the beauty salon, in the pool halls, in the bars, you know? In the um, workplaces. And in, in the military, places. sadly. Andy? With this war going on and the incredible escalation, not only of war, but of military spending. We don't have Build Back Better because we just sent $40 billion to, of armaments. We're just gonna keep the war going rather than force uh, a negotiated settlement. So that is the, also in the background. and. And it's on the basis of building from below that we also see the need to reach out and involve other class forces, all who have a stake in preserving a, a democracy. Um, mm -hmm. That's where the broader people's front, that all people's front against fascism uh, comes into play. 
because we need a, a broad front to oppose the uh, attempt by uh, a Trump and company to establish a dictatorship. And that's what they're trying to do, establish a dictatorship. There's no question about it. Um, I want to move to the last question because we're running out of time. Uh, we got a uh, note from a uh, reader who asked the following. Uh, he says, hello, I am an aspiring uh, communist myself, and I agree mostly with uh, your values and stances. He says, however, I am a little conflicted. I grew up in a conservative household, and while I have strayed from those mores and views, I do hold on to some. So I'd like some clarification, Scott. To be a communist, must I agree absolutely with everything in the communist agenda? Like, I don't know, I don't want to hurt nobody's feeling, but you know, do I have to hold your position on abortion and 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 uh, race and LGBTQ rights in order to be a communist, Scott? Uh, so really there. You know, there are a couple of distinctions that need to be drawn. Um, you know, no one, no one's going to uh, force you to have an abortion. Uh, I can promise you that. Um, you, uh, however, cannot um, be a communist and deny the basic equality of, of other people, um, the, the right of everybody to have autonomy over their own uh, body and their own uh, reproductive health. Uh, you can't be a communist and uh, reject the equality of LGBTQ people uh, because it, the liberation of the proletariat is not possible when these other um, forms of, of, of domination and of oppression uh, still exist. You know, we'll never get to socialism um, without equal without fighting for the equality of LGBTQ people, of women, of people of color. Um, so this, these questions, these what we call democratic questions, um, which you might call, you know, social issues or uh, some people call identity issues, um, are for us basic questions of political struggle. The class struggle isn't possible without them because how can we unite the working class in the struggle for its own freedom uh, if we are willing to, you know, leave part of it behind struggling under uh, white supremacy or male supremacy or homophobia or, or any of these other uh, forms of oppression. Anita, Leonard said someplace that it takes 10 years, a decade to become a communist. So if Lenin was right, and if Scott is right, that you have to have a belief in you know, basic equality values. Um, and, um, and it's going to take me 10 years to get there, given the fact that I grew up in a household that held inequality values. Uh, isn't that leaving a big section of the American population out, the American working class out, like 99.9% .9 of it? Well, I just I think we um, uh, the strength of our party is that we are united behind a, a specific program, and that's something that's specified in our constitution that membership means you agree with you 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 endorse the party program, which is a, a long and a long document that not everyone has read cover to cover, um, but it, it it spells out these basic agreements that we have, like Scott said about equality among people um, and uh, that. That, that are just like non-negotiable. But I think what Lenin meant uh, by that was more than just, you know, endorsing a program, which is something we do expect of all members, to, but to become a, a real commun communist who participates and organizes um, his or her community. Uh, these are these are um, these are skills that take a long time to develop. And uh, and I think that's what is meant by that that idea. And, and Joe? Uh, I think we also, I think we also have to point out that that the equality is a basic value of the working class. Um, you know, um, inequality, oppression; these are things that come from 
the ruling class. It's in their interest. If you think about how capitalism works, it has worked by bringing, to get, bringing workers together in bigger and bigger groups, um, leveling out their conditions of work, making them, putting them in a, in a condition of, you know, material equality and, and common material interests uh, with each other. And the cap that's dangerous to the capitalist class. That's Marx's point in the, in the manifesto, is that when you bring workers together, when you get them working in uh, in unity, when you put them on a basis of equality, they start getting ideas about working class power and things like that. So the capitalist class has to keep the pressure on, keep hammering home the, these messages of, you know, uh, discrimination against LGBTQ people, of, you know, uh, the threat of, of woke culture and, and all this and that. Um, that's, that's them. The working class instinctively, I think, reaches for equality and solidarity and collectivity, uh, not for division and, and hierarchy. Sandy, in one minute, because we have to end, are we on a journey? And aren't most men in this country influenced by male supremacy to one degree or another? And aren't most whites influenced by racism to one degree or another? And it requires constant struggle and vigilance to overcome these. And, and shouldn't this journey approach inform our approach to the different levels that people are at, even though they have a general desire for a better world um, and they're willing to pledge, but ain't it the truth that most people aren't there yet and, and that we have to engage with them and struggle? That's, and, and we have a, a youth league uh, to help uh, folks come into socialism uh, to acquire these values uh, and to help weed out um, the bourgeois influences that they uh, grew up in. So I, I, I'm very impressed by uh, the growth uh, that we are having uh, among the youth, and, and that's the future. And I think that's a, a, a Lenin's approach, too, that the, each generation comes to socialism in its own way. and. Uh, Let's... We fight with people on the basis of interest. Let's agree on what we can agree, um, while at the same time maintaining our right to carry on a conversation, a dialogue, a debate uh, with our co-workers and comrades in arms as we march down the road of struggle together. And I think that's the most important thing. And so, my friend, if you're listening, join the Communist Party and be open to listening and hearing what we're saying and others are saying and changing your views. You ain't got to have a march 100% in lockstep, but you have to be willing to pledge 100% to grow and learn in the context of a revolutionary collective. That's the most important thing. And after 10 years, you'll be able to put on your Lenin pen or <laughs> your Henry Winston pen or your Elizabeth Gurley Flynn pen or your Rosanna Cambrone pen <laughs> and, and march proudly towards the socialist future together. Sandy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, glad to be here, thank you. You can read the Communist Party of Boston statement at cpusa.org on the recent uh, attacks. If you're in Boston, sign up, join the Communist Party, uh, and we'll see you next week. Until then, stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Later, comrades.